nothing more. So, for instance, think of M as a function that computes uh, descriptive statistics on the encrypted data or SQL queries or some such things. So this, um, the goal is to uh, reconcile privacy and useful data mining. And so other user, Carol, should get access to a different function, G, applied on, on the data M, and nothing more. So the way uh, this is, uh, sorry, so this has been generalized to the multi-input setting, where uh, different user encrypts uh, different messages independently for different input slots, and the, the user get ex can extract from this ciphertext some partial information on the joint messages M1 and M2. So now they are binary functions, but you can generalize that for polynomially many slots. And the way this is implemented is as follows. There is a trusted setup that is going to generate a public key that is used to encrypt for each message, each messages for each slot. And a master secret key that is used by a key generation algorithm to generate keys for particular functions. So each key is going to be different for every function. So like the key generation algorithm takes the master secret key as input and the description of a function f and produces a secret key for f. And uh, if a user gets a secret key for f, then it can e extract from this ciphertext the function f of m1 and 2, and nothing more, as I said. And a different function, uh, a different key for a different function will leak this information. So, as I said, uh, the important part uh, for privacy is to leak only a partial information on the encrypted messages. So here, this would be f of m1, m2. Uh, so this, um, oh sorry. So uh, the multi-input setting is useful when the, the data is distributed among different users. Or, uh, for example, if one user encrypts some data, but at different point in time. So this is a useful general generalization of a single input uh, FE. And uh, the important property is that for privacy, that we want to leak only this partial information on, F uh, on M1, M2. But in fact, uh, in the public key setting, a secret key for F leaks much more information than just F of M1, M2. Because Bob, for example, could encrypt uh, any messages he wants for slot one, and any messages he wants also for slot two. So, for example, he could get uh, from this ciphertext, he could extract much more than uh, just of, from f of m1, m2, but also f of m, m2, and f of m1, m prime for any messages m, m, m prime of his choice. So, this is a lot of leakage, and this is by definition, this is inherent. And same thing holds for Carol or any other secret key. So, in fact, this, uh, this means that the security for public key functional encryption in the multi-input setting is a bit weak. Um, so we, uh, for this reason, because the leakage is inherently so huge, we will consider the private key setting. So now there are no public key, and the master secret key is necessary to encrypt messages for each slot. So this way, we don't have uh, that much leakage. Bob cannot simply encrypt messages of his choice for any slots. But still, there is uh, some issue with this definition. In particular, if there is many ciphertexts per slot. So here, we have only two ciphertexts and two slots. And Bob, from his secret key for F, can decide to decrypt these messages with this one and get, by definition, by correctness, it will get F of M1, M2. But he can also decide to decrypt these messages with this, uh, this ciphertext and this one and get a different F of M1 and to prime, and, and so on and so forth, for every possible combination. And the same is true for any other secret key. So in general, if you have n slots, and q ciphertext per slot, uh, the number of values that is leaked per key is exponential in n, it's q to the n. So this is uh, also a very uh, huge leakage of information for, from the secret key for f and j. So the security definition uh, ensures that there is a resistance to collision of user. So if a set of user joins a secret key together, they should not learn anything more than what they individually know, that what each individual key uh, reveals. OK, so this is the definition. Mm. So as I said, this, is a, this could be a problematic to have such a huge leakage in general. But for, in our case, 
will have uh, this exponential number uh, in n will be in fact linear in n. For the restricted class of function we are considering, this is actually q times n. So this, uh, this is how we avoid this issue. So now let me present some uh, known results uh, about multi-input FE. So this is possible to build multi-input FE for any general circuit. Um, there are many constructions, and they support uh, polynomially many slots, or even unbounded for some constructions. But they are all based on non-standard assumptions. Uh, for example, they are based on um, IO for general circuit, or so IO for multilinear maps or IO from general circuit, or even stronger notion of obfuscation. Uh, all of these objects we don't know how to build from standard assumption. Other uh, series of works have built uh, multi-input FE from single input FE for general circuit, and again, we don't know how to build this from standard assumption. So the question we asked is, can we build a, a fee, multi-input FE, for, uh, based on standard assumption, even if it's for only restricted class of functions, if it's still an interesting class of function. So we, uh, we built um, multi-input FE for inner product, which consists of um, uh, the, this setting where each, uh, okay, so, uh, each slot encrypts a vector of dimension m over some vector space. And uh, the secret key is associated with a vector y of dimension n times m. And the decryption of all this uh, ciphertext uh, with this secret key leaks the function inner product. So the inner product of this huge vector x, concaten the concatenation of all of the xi with uh, inner product y. So this is a functionality we built. And it's based on two linear maps, so standard assumption SXDH. And it supports polynomially many slots. So this is the first construction that is based on a standard assumption uh, and with a polynomial security loss. Okay. Uh, and this is a generalization of uh, Abdallah et al. and uh, Agrawal et al. prior works, which, which build an uh, inner product uh, encryption for single slot. So we managed to get from one slot to polynomially many slots with only one uh, increase in uh, the degree of the multilinear maps we need is only one. From, so namely from DDH to uh, pairing. Okay. So this is in contrast with the, the work from um, Li Li uh, who built a same inner product functionality from a similar assumption, standard assumption from pairing, but only for two slots. So we managed to get directly to polynomially many, many slots. So it's remarkable that we can go from one to polynomially with only one, uh, one degree more, essentially. Uh, it's also interesting to notice that even if it's only one degree more, this is still a qualitative gap. We need a stronger assumption to go from a single slot to many slots. And this is not the case, for example, for large classes of function. So in these works, it has been shown that you can go from single input to multi-input uh, with no extra assumption, only with a, you only have to pay a price in the security loss. So this is more a quantitative gap. So for us, we need something stronger, but not too much, essentially. So now let me present the construction. The paradigm is simple. We simply build a multi-input FE from a single input FE. I'll show first a natural but a bit naive approach, which works for any FE, single input FE. But I'll show that uh, actually it doesn't, uh, doesn't work uh, really well, and I'll show how to modify this to get actually something that works, but using a particular single input FE, uh, namely the one from Agarwal Liberstele. And we'll use some structural properties of this scheme to get many uh, multi input FE. But the first step is still instructive to see uh, okay, why this works. So the first uh, naive attempt would be simply to go from single input to multi input we can do for n slots, uh, we can simply do n parallel copies of the single input. So the setup is going to generate independently n times the master secret key for the single input slot, uh, single input FE. And each secret key is used to do the encryption uh, for each slot. And the key generation for a uh, vector y that you can write as a concatenation of many vectors y, yi is going to be the concatenation of all the secret keys 
generated using the single input FE uh, for all the yi. Okay, so it's really just a, a simple n repetition. Uh, thanks to this key, Bob can decrypt, uh, can extract from all of this ciphertext the, the, the value xi times yi for every i. And thanks to this, you can simply sum all of them and get the, the function you're supposed to get, which is the sum of all i of xi, yi. The problem with this is that uh, Bob gets more information than simply the sum of all the xi, yi. He also gets all the partial inner product. So this term here. And in fact, this is not something that should be leaked. At least in the private key setting, this should be hidden. Uh, Bob should only get this information. Uh, in, in fact, in the public key setting, this is supposed to leak. This is inherent, and this would actually work if you use a single input public key FE. This would be a valid multi-input public key FE. But as I said at the beginning, the, the private key case is more interesting because there is less leakage, and in particular, uh, the technical challenge is to hide all of this partial inner product while still allowing Bob to get the, the full sum for all i of the xi, yi. Okay, so this is why the naive attempt doesn't work. So our idea was to modify the um, encryption scheme. We are not going to use simply the single input FE encryption and not the single input FE key gen. We are going to modify them in a way that Bob doesn't get the um, inner product xi, yi, but an encryption of the xi, yi. And there's some secret key for i. Okay. So essentially, since this is encrypted, Bob gets no information at all about this partial product x i y i. But still, w we need correctness. So it's, um, we will use a linearly homomorphic encryption so that Bob can combine all of this encryption for the partial product x i y i to obtain, it can sum, sum them up to obtain an encryption of the, the sum of all i of xi, yi, which is what it's supposed to get, but under a, another key, which is the sum of the keys, S S K I. Okay. So this, is, um, this exists. For, uh, in our case, we are, uh, we are actually going to use the LGAMAL encryption, which satisfies this property. And then when, if we include in the secret keys for y this sum of the secret key tilde i, then Bob can actually decrypt and recover the function he's supposed to get. And because we only give the sum of all the sk tilde i, essentially Bob mm, only can extract from all of this uh, ciphertext, he only can extract the sum, essentially. That's uh, the idea. Uh, now, how do we implement this idea? Well, uh, so as I said, we'll use um, particular single FE which is the one from Agrawal Liberstelle. And uh, we'll use it, but so this will be the encryption, the single input uh, FE encryption of Agrawal Liberstelle, uh, but not of xi, but of the vector xi, where we add one dimension and uh, we add this value here, sk tilde i. Okay, we don't encrypt simply xi, we, we augment the dimension by one, okay? And we also augment the dimension of all the, vect uh, the, the vector yi by one. So the key gen is going to pick a random uh, scalar r, which is fresh, fresh for any key generation. And the secret key is going to be for this vector, extended vector. OK. Um, and the, so the, as I said, we'll, uh, this uh, encryption we should get is uh, LGAMAL encryption, so we'll the, we'll, this will be simply uh, LGAMAL secret keys. Okay. Um, so in the agrawal liberstelle encryption scheme, these are vectors of group elements in, in some group of prime order P. And what you get when you decrypt uh, this vector with this secret key is exactly this term here. So for all i, Bob can decrypt this thing. So this will be the useful part, xi times yi, but it's, this is actually a, an LGAMAL encryption of the partial product xi times yi. This is the secret key of the LGAMAL encryption, and this is the randomness. So the, the, the reason we put, uh, so since we want to use uh, the security of LGAMAL, we, we need to argue that this secret key i is hidden. So the, we essentially we can use the security of the single input FE because this secret key should be hidden. It should, it should only leak uh, here. Uh, okay, so the ciphertext hides the, the attribute here. 
the vector here. In particular, it hides the secret key. Um, and uh, we pick a random different R for every key to avoid a collision um, between keys, so mix and match attacks. So since these R are independent for each key, we, we have uh, collision resistance. Okay. Now the problem is that, uh, as I showed you at the beginning, uh, functional encryption ensures that the the vector, uh, un the underlying vector of the ciphertext is hidden, essentially. But uh, the secret key doesn't have to hide its underlying vector, and in fact, it reveals completely. Uh, it actually, in the case of Agrawal Liberstele, it contains in the clear the underlying vector. So all of the y i times uh, concatenated with r are leaked in in DP. So this is a problem if we want to use uh, DDH here, because you cannot reveal R in the clear. So this is where we have to modify uh, slightly the, the scheme. And uh, what we do is we, we are going to use a pairing. And we are going to so the, the billion maps E that goes from uh, source group G1 times G2 to a target group. This will be, this will be untouched. but. Now the secret key, essentially, we are going to put it in the exponent. So instead of having uh, ZP elements, we, are, we have group elements in G2. And now this is fine, because the secret key only reveals G2 to the R. And uh, to, to decrypt, essentially, now we need a pairing uh, to compute uh, this uh, times this part. And uh, what we get is uh, the same as before, but in the target group. And now we can use, essentially, we use DDH here to hide the partial inner product. So this is security and correctness. You can still combine all of this stuff, because this is an Elgaman encryption, uh, to get this. And because uh, the sum of all the secret key uh, tilde i are included in the secret key uh, for vector y, then Bob can decrypt and get the inner product, essentially. So that is uh, roughly the ID. Um, so. So this, uh, this was an overview of uh, the proof for our construction. So as I said, we built an inner product encryption from billionaire maps, which support uh, polynomially many slots. But it still requires a uh, stronger assumption than for the one slot. So a natural question that we can ask is, can we remove uh, the pairing? Could we do this, but without any pairing from DDH? I would be surprised, but a re really nice, uh, interesting result. And more generally, uh, what kind of um, classes of function can we do from standard assumption and the minimal assumption? OK, so this concludes my talk. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, do you think it is possible to uh, uh, extend to the unbound slot case? Um, it's an interesting question. So um, we didn't really think about the unbounded case. Uh, it seems it doesn't seem really straightforward directly from our scheme to extend it, but okay. it will be interesting. Okay, thanks. <laughs>